everyone, and welcome to another 202 Creates Masterclass. I'm your host, Britt Waters, and we have another opportunity to learn today. I'm very excited about our guests, and I know you will be too. We have so much in store for you, but let's first talk about 202 Creates. It's an initiative of the Office of Cable Television, Film, Music, and Entertainment, led by director Angie M. Gates, to support creatives just like you in all ways. We are your village, so make sure you take advantage of everything we have to offer with features like producing entrepreneurship program, our biannual residency program, and so much more. So make sure you write this down. 202creates.com has everything you need. Now we're talking about the arts. And when I think about the arts, I think bright lights, big stage, tons of fun. But behind that, there's a grind, there's hard work, there's experience. And we're gonna dive into that with today's guest, actor, director, and educator, Kenyatta Rogers. Thank you so much for joining me. How are you feeling? I'm feeling great. How are you, Britt? Well, I'm great, and we're so happy to have you. Kenyatta has directed and acted in more than 50 theater productions in the D.C. area, earning him so many awards, including several of the coveted Helen Hayes Award nominations. He's an outspoken activist and advocate for inclusion and access and equality in the collegiate and professional theater. Kenyatta is also professor of theater at Montgomery College, and in 2014, he was named Maryland Professor of the Year by the Carnegie Foundation for the advancement of teaching. Kenyatta is an alum of Clark Atlanta University and has a master's in fine arts and acting from the University of Pittsburgh. We see you, Kenyatta. <laughs> now, these titles are what people dream about. Actor, director, advocate, those are dream jobs. How did it all get started for you? I like the way you phrase that question. They are dream jobs uh, for folks who are interested in communicating their what's on their mind and what's in their heart to an audience. Uh, but it's a lot of verb, right? Those are the nouns of it all. Those are the titles. Uh, but a lot of it is just the passion. Uh, it starts down deep somewhere and you find your way into a community uh, that is there to support you and hold you. Uh, when I first started off, uh, I was my first uh, inkling that I knew I wanted to be in this art uh, and to do the verbs of it all was when I was about four, three? Four. Four, three. And I didn't really know what the instinct was. Um, you know, you had that rambunctious child, that child that won't sit down, that child that won't stop talking. So for those of you who, out there who, that's you, you know, we're in the same community. But I remember a picture of me by my father's Monte Carlo and I am pouting, I'm upset. And later on, it was told to me that I wanted to take the picture and be in it at the same time. I really, I was the first selfie, whatever it is. And so I understood, it was then that that story kind of feeds into kind of where I've been the entire time in this art, which is I wanted to see all sides of it, to be able to host the conversation, to be able to see the conversation, to be able to contextualize the conversation. And that lasted all the way through, you know, my interest in theater and high school. I had really good programs uh, here in Maryland that allowed me access to great teachers, great material. Uh, very early in my career, I was introduced to August Wilson uh, through Center Stage up in Baltimore through my high school. I uh, went to Clark AU down in the Atlanta University Center. Was in contact with some of the best teachers. And my best teachers, yes, again, the titles were wonderful. Uh, they had won all kinds of awards, done all kinds of things, but they were active, actively pursuing the art, active in their interest in education, uh, active in uplift of our country, but more specifically, uh, our race. And that, kind, that kept on um, fueling uh, that desire to either be in the picture or to be on the outside taking or directing the picture. Uh, and that continued through uh, graduate school at University of Pittsburgh. So my son always teases me and he says, dad, when was your first gig? And I give him a different answer every time. Mm -hmm. The way that they hit me is either as a professional, either as a union member. Uh, perhaps I go back in time and it's the first time I was on stage with a paying audience. And so they, the, they kind of um, uh, meld together because I was always doing the verb which was wanting to perform, to entertain, to host the conversations in a way that allowed the audience to 
hold them, the conversation, host the ideas inside that conversation and make decisions for themselves. So, um, yeah, so I guess I've been acting since I was tiny. Uh, and uh, when I came to DC is probably when it first started to click to me that this is something I wanted to do for, for my life. Wow, you were determined from three? At three, I think I still wanted to drive the ice cream truck, but you literally made your and dreams you come true. you can do that. You can still can. drive the ice cream <laughs> truck. You can do that. You know, my, my changes, I've, I've had different things that I've wanted to do since then, but I love how you just had your eye on the prize and you really made it happen for yourself. When it comes to learning the game, um, everyone thinks that it's so easy to be an actor or to be a director. Oh, I just memorized some lines. How do you really learn and study if you're looking to get into this? A couple of different answers there. The business side of it is to absolutely positively be current with the business trends and what people want to do and what people want of you. You can go out and get yourself an agent very quickly. Uh, you can go out and get yourself headshots and resumes. Um, but you described an actor and a director and folks who are doing the technical uh, aspects or the design aspects, and those are artists. And that community of artists you'll find along the way. And they will train you. When I say they will train you, you're in a training program, but I learned as much from my peers in a program as I could have, I think more than I could have on my own. And that is about the give and take of the profession. That is about the language of the profession. That is about the way that you care for someone in the profession. And it's those things that I think have kept me moving forward and hungry and not burned out. I have to be renewed within the business and within the art uh, because it can be a tough grind. So I'm always looking for like-minded people and if not like-minded people, people that will push me forward uh, and in the hopes uh, and, and that we're on the same team, right? In theater, we call that an ensemble. So I want to be a member of the ensemble in some way uh, to help push either conversations forward or agendas forward um, that, will, uh, that will host the community in which I am living. Wow. You talked about learning from your peers. And I think that's powerful because everyone thinks once you've made it, you don't have to learn anymore, but you're forever learning. So can we talk about some of the lessons that hit you the hardest on this long journey to success? Remember the things that made you stop and think like, oh, that was hard. Hmm. I'll go back to high school real quick. Uh, I am not known in the DC region as the most powerful singer out there. Uh, but when I was in high school, I jumped up on a box to have my first solo, which I thought was gonna be easy. I'm gonna jump up, do your thing, sing your song, sit down, people clap. And I saw that audience and whew, everything went away, just gone. And the ensemble, I maybe missed a word. They recognized it, had worked with me, understood the way that I worked, and immediately was like, that brother just lost, it's not coming back. Picked up and sang the rest of my solo right there in the moment. And it's that kind of moment throughout my career uh, that's made me say, it may be hard, it may be difficult, but it happens to us all. And to be compassionate when I'm seeing those things, but at the same time, you are training to be the best on point and ready for the next uh, opportunity that comes up. But when those hard times do come, uh, it's great to be able to call your friend across town and be like, do you know what just happened? You're not gonna believe what just happened to me. Don't tell nobody, but this happened. Um, to be able to come back home uh, to uh, my loving spouse and say, oh, it's been that kind of day. Uh, I'm going out to get me the most sugary coffee drink I can possibly find uh, just to pick myself up. Uh, but to know that tomorrow is another day that you've got to pick yourself back up because the business is going to continue. Uh, it's not that it's, uh, that it's an unfeeling business or that it's a hard business. It's just that you have to get to understand that your job is to be on every time there's a person around, whenever there's a camera around. It's your job to deal with rejection on a daily basis if you're, if you're lucky enough to have that many auditions, but it's just a part of the job. Uh, and to recognize that you will find, if you are looking hard enough, your crowd, you know, where you belong. Uh, so if it gets hard, I am going to lean on those peers to either tell me who I am and remind me who I am, or 
I'm going to lean on that peer group to dive back in and find some work for myself. There's a sense of authority and confidence that you really have to have to know that that no that you receive is not no forever. It's just no for now. Where do you get that confidence from? That's a good question. I think it is. Uh, it goes back to that idea of the verb, uh, that if I'm not thinking of myself as an actor or a failed actor, I am acting. If I don't think of myself as a director with a title, but someone who directs plays, who shapes narratives, who encourages playwrights, uh, I dive back into the verb of it all. And so it, what I love about this profession is that it keeps changing. Um, the, what is asked of you or demanded of you keeps changing. Uh, and so keeping my ear uh, open so I can hear and see what those changes might be, uh, making sure that I am in concert with the artists around me uh, so that we are all moving in the same direction, it gets, it gets a little less hard. There are, there, no, there's that dream role that you go for and you know, you're too young, you're too old, you're too uh, old and young at the same time, just, just things you cannot decipher. You can't get inside a director's mind, so don't even try. Uh, but there is, um, I've been in the business long enough that when I was younger, yeah, things hurt in a different way. You know, it was, oh no, I'll never get another <gasps> a phone call. Or, oh no, this has been a really long time. Let me just go to another class or let me go to uh, some more theater and soak that up while I'm sitting in the audience. So let me, and in that meantime, I'm still theatering. It's still happening. I'm still learning. I'm still growing from my experience. Uh, and before I know it, that phone call. So it could come that next day. It could come three or four months later, but the entire time I'm still doing something to grow in my art and in my business. And so while I'm going to those shows, I'm networking, right? I am clear that I'm there to have a good time, show who I am, but to network, to ask all the questions, to listen to all the answers, even if I haven't asked the questions, to recognize what the questions are that other people have that I didn't even ask and make sure I can ask them when I'm in the room the next time. That I'm soaking up other people's art and that I'm soaking up their, their uh, ability uh, to command the stage. And so all those things are going inside me while I'm working. Uh, and it doesn't stop as you get older. I'm still watching what my peers are doing, what my mentors are doing, and what my students are doing and learning from that. So uh, I think with its eyes forward, uh, it's making sure that I am uh, still grinding, like you were saying, uh, and that, uh, um, I am doing self-checks to make sure that I'm doing what I preach. You talk a lot about your peers and your ensemble and those being your strength, but we know that this business can be competitive as well. And we're taught not to compare ourselves to others, but if we had a reality show on the theater world, what would we see? Is it really that family or like, how do you guys get over competitiveness? That's a good question. Again, I, I say good questions each time because I have to qualify each thing. The generation that I came into in the DC area is that family, has been that family. Uh, we have an organization called Galvanize and it's an email chain of folks who are keeping each other in the know. And for folks who are interested, uh, hopefully you'll have some um, information about how they can get connected into the theater world. But in the galvanized community and in the galvanized family, and then, you know, and this was happening before Facebook came along. And of course, you'll find your groups there as well, as well as your groups in other parts of the uh, cyberspace interwebs. But the family that was here before all that internet stuff, we auditioned together, we see each other at the same audition, and it was open arms hugs. So what I'm happy to see these younger folk doing is going back to that sense of community. Now, I also have to qualify that because that is town by town. And my friends from New York had different experiences. My friends from LA, different experiences. My friends from Chicago, different experiences. But it did seem like the DC crowd, right? Not only just all the actors around, but specifically the black community in DC of these artists. That's why I talk about peers. I didn't even realize I talked about peers that much, but I would have never gotten to where I am now without 
their assistance, without their help, without watching their work, without feeling that little competitive edge while I'm watching them do their work and saying, oh, that, mm, okay, they, yeah, okay, they won that one. They won that one. I can see why they won that role, uh, but I'm going to be ready for them next time. So the competition does nothing but make you better when you feel like you're playing on the same team. It's easy to see that you're in an ensemble, hopefully, uh, when you're in the same show. But DC has always felt like its own ensemble of actors. And I think and I can say that with some confidence, especially for the generation I came up in, because when people would come to DC to audition, they would talk about that. Does everybody know everybody? Y'all seem so cool with each other. And so on and so on. That's how we do it in the district. Got to stick that's together. How it, that's how we do it. But you did speak on different generations. I'm curious to know. If you could look back and finish this sentence, when I started my journey, I wish I knew what? When I started this journey, I wish I knew how to accept the changes that were inevitable in a way that provided me time for self-reflection and respite. Wow. So, it's uh, so it's it's both a strategy, but also knowing when to take your foot off the gas. And so at the same time, I will speak like a mercenary <laughs> while I'm truly, not too facedly, hugging the folks that are in the room. We know we're in competition for the same job. And so if a job came up, I said yes. Job, yes. Job, yes. Job, absolutely. Job, when? Job, where? And so early in my career, I was trying to soak up anything and everything I possibly could. And what I think this younger generation is doing is understanding that kind of need for reflection inside their self-care. And so I would advocate for folks to, um, again, recognize what's in the air and in the industry and in the uh, field right now, which is recognizing that you cannot do your absolute best work uh, unless you have that time for uh, downtime reflection. And so that's, again, going back to when you're not working, you're working. You're always working. You may not be on the stage at that time, but you, you, should, be, you should be finding the ways to uh, recharge the batteries. And sometimes that's not theater. Sometimes that's not performing. Sometimes that's looking out your window, taking a walk. But I would be hard pressed to find a theater person that isn't thinking theater thoughts while they're doing that thing that doesn't look like theater, that isn't processing what they're seeing outside their window, processing what they're hearing next door in their neighbor's apartment, and uh, suddenly interacting with that as an artist. So um, yeah, that's, that's the advice I would give myself. I'm curious what that downtime looks like for you. What is your kind of setup? Do you do meditation? Is it reading? Is it family time? How do you escape? These days, it is long walks. Um, we have um, a couple of landmarks in our neighborhood that have, I would have never known existed, you know, if this um, quarantine didn't happen. Um, but it is those long walks that have me coming back and saying, okay, fine, let's go, let's go right back into it. And that is, that is very helpful. Um, for a while, I was uh, binging really good television, like really, really good television. Um, oh, like what series? Oh, man. Uh, you said really, really good. So now I got to write yeah, it down. Well, okay. You know, um, I want to get the title right. Um, I May Destroy You or May. Yeah, I think it's called that. Uh, maybe I've heard of that. On that one. Um, let's see what else. Uh, I had never seen The Office, so I went back and watched The Office, and I was one of those people who had never seen an episode of The Office. We I can know. tell you have a busy life if you've I never know. seen The Office. It's always on. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, uh, Lovecraft Country. Ooh, so good. Such good work. So good. Um, just all kinds of beautiful things. Oh, P Valley. Um, uh, and M so I, cricket letter, cricket letter, I, hump back, hump back, I. <laughs> And that is written by another theater person, Katori Hall. I knew I met her when she was an undergrad and she was on her game back then, all the way back then. So um, and so and I would say that this is, a, you know, a not a humble brag. 
you're finding theater people writing for television. And so I think that's what drew me back into it. But I'm also starting to gravitate back towards watching uh, digital theater and finding places where uh, artists who usually perform live are finding ways to reach their audiences through digital landscapes. Uh, so that is another place that people can find themselves. It's not just in hibernation and waiting, but being proactive about how they want to put themselves out there. They can create their own content. They can find people who are creating content and find them and join them. Uh, but that they can go out there and, and create an audience, create a following so that they can be led back into uh, live uh, performances when they're when we are ready. Yes, I can't wait for that day. But one thing I love about your story and your achievements is that you've taken that and poured back into the community, investing your time into activism and education. What are ways that artists can learn to do that too? When I first started in DC, I started with a company called African Continuum Theater Company, which was led by the absolutely brilliant Jennifer Nelson. And uh, she was really keen uh, about who she surrounded herself with. Um, and so I think a lot of that ensemble feel that I was talking about before really comes from people like her, uh, who set the stage for artists that came into DC uh, to um, recognize what they could do. Um, she saw you as an actor, sure, and she hired you and she gave you your star, but she saw people as much more. We worked in the office. Uh, I got my start in education with her. Uh, specifically theater education in the DC area. So I was writing um, uh, playbills and guides for children who were going to be attending the shows. I was inviting their parents to come see the shows as so they were coming as a community, as a family. And so looking for opportunities to reach out and be an ambassador for the art in any way that you can uh, is not only a way to support your art later on, but also to possibly support your pockets while you're waiting for that. Uh, break the, to get on stage. Uh, and so anything that you can do in a box office, education program, marketing, outreach, any skills that you have, if you've got a slash, slash, slash in terms of the uh, things that you can do, uh, activate all of them. And so those are things that you can do to uh, be a part of the theater community, but also to reach out to your community around you. And talk about the importance of doing that, because a lot of people say, I, I'm on stage, this is my lane, this is where I'm at. That's not my conversation to have, but there is a responsibility there. I think so, but I think folks also have to recognize what they do and what they do best. You know, um, <laughs> uh, there's a famous Shakespeare play, Coriolanus, where they have this warrior who absolutely destroys the, the enemy and they wanna make him a Senator. And so they make him stand up and ask the people for their vote. And he is not, 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 not that dude. He's not that guy. What he does is warrior, that's his verb. And so although the responsibility I think is one of self-responsibility and self-respect and self-esteem. But if you are excellent in your craft, keep being excellent in your craft for the things you wanna say. If you're somebody that reaches out to people and can um, hold them through a camera or can reach out to them and invite them into the theater some way, absolutely do that. Do all that you can for all that you can. Uh, and so uh, again, it's a part of your self-knowledge and knowing um, where you will continue to be renewed uh, if you keep doing the thing that you're doing. And it's also up for uh, folks in my generation and older to recognize those skills in people and to ask those things of them. So I think that responsibility is stepping up to bat when you are called for the thing that we know you can do. Uh, and so if you're not self-generating, be ready for the call. It's a great lesson to learn. Now we talked about DC compared to other cities. DC has always been known to be influential when it comes to fashion and music. Is it a great destination for theater? Oh my goodness, yes. What? Yes. Of course. DC can do it all. We already know that. But specifically when it comes to theater, when you take a look at the metrics, you have New York City, they're number one. They're never not going to stop being number one. All right, New York. But when you look at the metrics in terms of number of shows produced or union houses or equity hours worked, all these different metrics, DC has been number two or number three in the nation. 
So this is an epicenter for theater in the nation. Uh, and we have had incredible audiences. What we can do better is reach out to other folks who have not been coming traditionally in different communities. And I think one way to do that is to make sure, especially we can start honing that skill now, is what other kind of ways can we take our message uh, into those communities, whether it be through a digital landscape, uh, but it's also breaking things up and we're saying, hey, can we also do things outside of a theater itself, outside the walls of a theater? Can the idea of what we do uh, move out uh, into the communities themselves so we can meet people where they are? So. I think there's a lot of lessons to learn uh, from our current situation on where we can go next. What does DC look like from an auditioning perspective? <laughs> it, it, it can be tough to, to kind of break in, uh, to find where you belong. Um, but I think that you keep on pounding the pavement. So when things change, I'm gonna speak in terms of uh, the next steps, like what it was before and what it's gonna be after. And so you're going to want to find places like the Actors Center. You're going to want to find training programs across DC, like Studios Lab Theater or uh, a Montgomery College, or uh, and it, so it can be a theater, uh, a training program that's um, um, dedicated to training uh, actors on its own. It can be associated with uh, professional theater, or it can be in a college or university. And so you're gonna to wanna to hit the pavement there if you're just, just starting off to be trained on the skills, but also to find that community. But if you're also joining folks like the Actors Center, they're gonna have audition notices. They're going to have uh, tips on how to uh, create a self tape. They're going to have resources there for you, uh, for you to be able to hit the ground running. Uh, but then again, if the idea I think is to make sure that you're in contact with others, that you're not doing it by yourself. Uh, that you are finding those peers and finding that group of saying, hey, did you hear about this audition over here? Did you hear about that over there? Uh, so that you uh, are, are not only in the know, but all, again, being renewed. It's important to have that support system and that team. Tell me who's on your team. Oh, my gosh. Um, I am trying to create right now. Um, when, you, when you say on your team, I'm going to talk about the galvanized group again, uh, you know, and I could name folks like Jefferson Russell. I can name folks like J.J. Johnson, Dawn Ursula. Uh, I can name folks like Deirdre Starnes over there at first stage. So I, I've got like, a, my, like my inner circle, like who I came in here with, my people. Uh, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but that team right now, I'm trying to actually create teams for folks. And so uh, taking a look at uh, the hiring and practices and the, um, when I say practices, like best practices, but also what is your history? And just examining those things inside their companies to expand the team to folks that I used to be hired by that now we're in conversation with. And so trying to create um, BIPOC lists of designers or stage managers uh, to make sure that when someone asks, I'm never uh, at a loss when it comes to saying, oh yeah, you need a lighting designer? come over here. You need a sound designer, come over here. You need an actor who's a triple threat, I've got that for you. So that we become an even uh, greater force uh, in the decision-making uh, or in the decision hel helping to make the decisions about who is uh, where. And that is being done right now at the artist level. I'm hoping and I'm looking forward to participating in the conversation about how it happens in the leadership spaces. It has to, and it's so important. I mean, these days, People want to be DIY queens and kings. And they're like, I got two arms. I got two legs. I can do it all myself. But it is super important to have other people around you that know what they're doing and that specialize in that. It's really important. And you've really set out a standard and a blueprint. Who was the blueprint when you were coming up to you? I, I'm going to go back to Jennifer Nelson in terms of uh, holding her own company, um, bringing people together. She kind of did all that. Um, she started off with the African Continuum Theater Coalition, which was an umbrella group to help and host Black theater companies. When those Black theater companies fell away one by one, she created a theater company. She hired us, gave us, in some ways, training, gave us opportunities, and then we went out into the city and found our own. Uh, being an educator is always helpful. I, I have access to the best and brightest students. Uh, in the area and uh, can connect them uh, with the folks that I've been working with for the past 20, 30 years here in DC. 
so it is a web. And so, like you were saying earlier, it's about being a, a part of that web and making sure that you are doing your job uh, inside it. I want to talk about you in your zone for a minute, because like I host for the NBA, I have a sports background. So I see players watch film, they warm up. What does that look like when you're trying to embody a character or convey a story? Well, it starts with breath. And so I'm reading the script the first time and I'm just altering the rhythms of my breath, kind of aligning that with the world, the play, the world of the character on first read. Uh, then comes that research level where I need to know everything about that character. I need to know everything about that playwright. I need to know everything about the world in which the playwright was writing. And I need to know everything about the world the playwright is writing about. And I want to be the expert when I walk in the room on my character. On the play, yes, but especially on my character. And it's not that I can't be challenged or taught when I walk into the space, but that's the first level. So it, it's pretty, it's granular before you even walk into the room. Once you get into the space, it's again, how can I provide um, access to me for myself as an artist, but also for the other artists that are on stage. And that can be tough when you're battling the Metro and you're battling traffic and you're battling all these kinds of things. So getting to the space early, highly suggested. If you have that long drive, putting on music that reminds you of the world of the character, highly suggested. When you get into the space, making sure that you connect with each of the folks that are in the room with a hello, good morning, hey, how you doing? Highly suggested. Finding space, some space in that theater, no matter, no matter how small it can be, and it can be small sometimes, uh, to have your own space that you can focus on the task at hand, highly suggested. But on the other side, things that I don't think are talked about enough, finding ways to decompress after that journey is over. You're gonna take all those journeys to all those places, light and dark, that the audience pays you to go on. They're doing that because they're working through you. They're working out all the things that, sure, they're being entertained, but it's also, you know, got a bit of therapy in it. So they're seeing how their lives play out or how they don't want their lives to play out or how they wish their lives to play out. And you're the conduit for that. But then you gotta go home. So mm -hmm. finding a way to decompress, finding a ritual that ends the show for you each night, uh, finding a way back into your life after you, you leave the theater. Uh, so those things are learned. Some people use journaling. Some people use music. Some people learn, uh, use meditation. Uh, but um, that comes over time and borrowing rituals and creating your own. Uh, but for me, it usually starts with music. It starts with the soundscape of the space. Uh, and um, it, 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 it drifts after a while. When I get into the, uh, to the show itself, I'll have some music playing before the show perhaps. Um, but it's interesting how it starts to permeate everything in my life. And so then all of a sudden I'm starting to relate to people outside. I feel like each character has given me a way to grow as a person because I, I, I find new ways, new, bit, new bits of language that I've taken with me from the last character. Um, and so it kind of lives with you for a while, but you do have to take off the costume, make sure that you're not bothering people with your character. Um, so that's, that's the uh, beginning and the end of um, uh, character creation and um, uh, entering the world of the play. Let's talk about those things that stick. Cause I know there are like movies that I'll see. And for some reason, it'll be two years before I can stop looking at that actor as the character they played in that movie I loved because I feel like they've so absorbed it. What are those traits that you've absorbed? I think a movie process can be in some ways different because of the intended audience who's around me. And so while I'm getting into character for theater, I'm aware that there's an audience there and that we are playing together. I've invited you over my house and you said, sure, let's play. And we're playing a game together. So yes, we've created something for you as designers and as directors and as actors on stage that you're watching, but you're also a part of the game. And so my moments of um, connection almost can't be spoken about without the audience's presence and what they're informing me about in that moment. Sure, you got the answers, you know, you get all those stories about when something goes wrong for an actor on stage and how they covered. But it's also things that inform me where an audience will, will make a sound, they'll groan, 
they'll clap at a moment that I go, oh, that, that, is, that is absolutely information for my character to continue on. I played a character who was hobbled, um, uh, who had uh, his foot severed from his body. And um, I had a satchel on and I, I had to get up these steps, but it was after I just found out that the person I love loved me back. And I got to the steps and the audience had, had given me such the, a great feeling of, oh, we're so happy for your character. We, we are as happy for you and the character as the character must be inside the play. And I got to the steps and I just kind of leapt them on one foot. And they just roared because it was, it, was the, it was the information coming back from the audience that said, oh, your character's allowed to do this. They gave me the permission to make a choice on stage. So I deepened the relationship of, uh, with my characters based on what's happening uh, in the space around me. And I think that while you're training to be that character, being open to the possibilities in theater is one of the differences or a slight difference that you can find that happens on a nightly basis in rehearsal and then ultimately in the show. That deepens your relationship and your clarity about what you can do um, and, and, and um, it instills in you a sense of curiosity about where the character can go. Uh, so that's, that's, as you can clearly hear, my love for the training for theater. Yes, and you talking so much about audience involvement made me miss being a part of the audience and cheering for people and booing the people I don't like. I, I miss that. And it's changed so much with this pandemic. How has it affected you and the theater industry? It's been devastating, obviously, to the artist, uh, to the technicians. Uh, you start with the folks who turn the lights on. You start with the folks who show up to rehearsal. And then all the way up through the artistic directors and all the way up through producers and boards, uh, it's been tough to find ways to um, put your work out there. But it's also been tough because this is something that we, uh, this is a job, uh, this is a profession that we hold close. At the same time, again, I go back to community. There are uh, communities of folks who are out there still trying to produce, uh, still trying to find ways to get their message out. Uh, they are doing it through digital theater. They are doing it through interactive theater. They are doing it through um, live installations of art that audiences can visit. And, and um, I know that there are some theater companies that are uh, mailing uh, things to audiences and then the audiences can open their mail and they can be a part of the theater in, diff in a different way. Uh, there are people who are texting and saying, hey, here's a plot point that you may want to remember or think about. Or when it comes to the, when you watch the digital uh, event, you can interact in this way. So we are finding ways to interact with our audiences. Um, I'm working on a piece at Montgomery College where we are also finding ways to either interact or to play with, with that which is recorded and that which we perform, perform live. Um, the piece is called My America. And so the students are trying to find ways to get their message uh, to an audience about what they see and what they hope for America's future. And so that's got, we, we don't want to lose the live aspect of that, even if we can't be in the same space together. So it's hurt the bottom line. Um, it is, I think, hurt uh, uh, the individual artist um, uh, in terms of their desire to, to play to a live audience. Uh, but tomorrow's another day. Yes, looking forward to tomorrow. But while we're in the meantime, we have these places that we can go to kind of see and revisit old theater. What is on the list of must watch, must consume if you're trying to convert someone to be a theater buff like you? And you have to, of course, include some of the work that you've done. All right. So uh, you've got to find your theater, find three, find three theaters that do something slightly, well, exactly what you love. And then some theaters that do something maybe a little bit different from what you do. So I can tout so many theaters here in the area. We've got 50 something theaters before the pandemic that were producing theater. So there's something to go to every single night. Uh, I am a fan specifically in terms of the artists that are on the cutting edge of new works. Uh, the Welders is a theater group that is close to my heart. Um, I was with them at the very beginning. They have Welders 1.0, Generation 1.0, 2.0 and 3.0 right now, uh, which is made up of three, I'm sorry, five to maybe seven or eight playwrights with each generation. 
uh, that is uh, cutting edge, speaking to the very issues on the minds of, and I say issues, I mean the thoughts, the the the, um, the emotional roller coasters. The you know, it's not always about the political, but uh, it is absolutely personal uh, that the, the things that they want to say to their audiences and how they 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 put their stories together. Um, I would talk if I'm talking about a national audience. Dominique Moriso is a playwright. I would read. I would see uh, if there's something digital out there for them. You can see a show called Pipeline on um, Broadway HD. Um, and when it comes to the uh, theaters opening up, go see her work. Um, so uh, I would also take a look at um, smaller theater companies um, uh, that are struggling to do their thing. First stage down there in Virginia. The In Series is an opera company uh, that I'm working with uh, in the future. Um, we are working on a production of um, the magic flute called Black Flute with five or six absolutely diva opera singers that are just going to bring the house down. Um, and finding ways to, uh, what I like about in series mission is that they are using opera and they're also using theater. I think it's um, opera that speaks and theater that sings. And so they're finding kind of interactions between the two art forms to kind of remix how, how, how that's done. Uh, so I would just, you know, for me personally, that's what I'm doing, but I'm also encouraging people to find their home in the theater companies that they enjoy and to make sure that they're supporting them. So because you might say, oh, yeah, I'll go next month or I'll go the month after, oh, I'll go. But we are trying to bounce back to give the audiences uh, what they need to sustain them. We're going to need your support in any way that you can give it uh, immediately, if not now. Yes, do it now. I mean, you're dropping some hints about what's coming up next for you. Tell us what's next and how we can support you in it. All right. So the end series uh, Black Flute will be uh, digital as well as some live performances in June. So make sure you go to their website for the end series opera company here in D.C. Uh, I am hoping to work uh, with some theater companies. I'm going to... Um, keep some of those things under wraps, but I will say that the companies uh, are large DC based companies. That's the other thing is that we have companies here in DC. We have artists here in DC, but of course we go across the lines into Virginia and, and, and Maryland to do our work. Um, so I'm gonna wait till the ink is dried on some of those and make sure I come back to you, Britt, with uh, what some okay. of those projects are. But the important thing is that the DC theater companies are looking to open and to open safely for their artists as well as for their uh, patrons. Uh, they are the, the plans are in place. Each of them have a plan to make sure that people can come back into the space. And we're just awaiting uh, the uh, time that we can do that uh, safely. So we'll be ready for folks when they come back in. I love that optimistic approach and it gets people excited. I would, I could talk to you all day. This has been such a great conversation. And I know there's so many people that are watching that are like, I want to be like Kenyatta one day. What can you leave that person with? Uh, a desire to say hello to you after the show. A promise that we will be back. The encouragement that you are enough whenever you walk into a space and the hope that you find your peer group, your family, uh, to know where you belong in this art. Uh, I am an actor and a director and an educator. Who are you? You could be a designer, you could be a board member, you could be an artistic director, you could be the best patron ever. Uh, but to find your place, to find your space uh, in and surrounding this art. Powerful words. Thank you so much for joining us in this masterclass, Kenyatta. You dropped so many gems. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm sure everybody watching this is at home giving you a standing ovation, the theater way. And thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoy the discussion and learn just as much as I did. And make sure you stay tuned to 202 Creates for another masterclass. Share this, save it, tag a friend, tag us. I'm sure someone can learn just as much as you did today by you giving this to them. Join 202 Creates on the next masterclass and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, everything. All of our information is at 202creates.com. I'm your host, Brooke Waters. Thank you for hanging out with us and I'll see you next time.